Hello everyone, in this video we're going to talk about how convolution is used in natural language processing. And yes, it's used in more than just computer vision. So let's get to it. So convolution is the application of one function onto another function in order to get a third function. And this operation is going to be an element-wise product followed by a sum. So if we take a look at this with an actual example, let's say that we have some function that produces a list A and another second function that produces some list B. And now we want to perform this convolution operation. This is essentially going to be an element-wise product followed by a summation. So in this case, we have A that's given over here in red, and we'll slide the elements of B one at a time. And in each case, we will take the sum of products. So in this case over here, we have one times five, plus all of these are padded with zero. One times five is five, and we have six times one plus five times two, that's gonna be 16. Seven times one plus six times two plus five times three, that's 34. And we slide this until the last element of the first function aligns with the last element of the second function. In this case, that's four times eight, which will be 32. And so the output here is going to be a list of seven elements. Now, this kind of traditional convolution in a lot of the neural network and deep learning space, if you read a lot of papers, it's going to be called a wide convolution because we start by matching the first element of the first function with the first element of the second function in order to perform the convolution. This is a little different from the convolutions that we would typically see in image processing. So for example, we have an input image, which is this green matrix. And on top of that, we are sliding a kernel or a filter, which is this yellow matrix. We take an element wise product and then sum all of them in order to get the individual elements of this pink matrix. This here is the convolve feature. Now, one thing to note about this convolution is that it's not the same as the wide convolution that we saw before. And in fact, we see that the filter is almost entirely within the image. While if we were to actually perform a wide convolution, we would have used some padding around this image so that the filter can slide across every single element equally. The idea of convolution here in a lot of deep learning applications is that by changing some of the filtered values and applying it on an image, we can extract different features about this image. While convolution neural networks are very useful in processing image data, they are also useful in processing temporal data. Now, temporal data is data that has some sequence or ordering to it. For example, language or speech. One of the earliest uses of this convolution in a neural network was actually in 1989 for phoneme detection. That is for a given input sound wave, we determine what is the phoneme or the sound that is produced. In this case, it's b, d, or g as a classification problem. So in this case, we take a raw speech wave, we chunk it up into 10 millisecond bytes, and each of those 10 milliseconds is encoded into a 16 dimensional vector. So it's represented by 16 numbers. And those 16 numbers are mel scale filter bank coefficients. Let's talk about how we're applying convolution to this architecture in order to do phoneme detection. So with convolution, we know that we have to perform an element-wise product followed by a summation. In this case, we are going to take a sliding window of size three. So we're dealing with three elements at a time. Each element is going to be one sliver of that sound wave. That is, this sliver here is going to be a 10 millisecond sound wave, which is a one cross 16 vector. Then we have another one cross 16 vector and a third one cross 16 vector. Now, for each of these, we're going to, well, convolve. Again, we need to convolve three other elements. And these three elements, you can take them as matrices of 16 cross eight. So we have three vectors of one cross 16. We convolve it with three matrices of 16 cross eight. And when you do like an element wise product with them, well, if you do a one cross 16, multiplied by a 16 cross eight, you get a one cross eight vector for each case. Now we end up with three one cross eight dimensional vectors. Now we take the sum, which well, if you sum up three vectors of one cross eight, you get another one cross eight vector. And so if we perform the convolution of just this box over here, this region right here, we're going to get this one cross eight vector over here. 
So that's an element wise product followed by a summation. And so one thing to note is that the number of parameters here is going to be three times 16 times eight. That's the sliding window. Next, we slide it over this way temporally by one unit. And now we enter, well, let's change the color a little bit so we can see it. We now come to this region over here and we apply the same convolution operation. That's an element wise product to get three eight cross one vectors. And then you sum them up to get one, one cross eight vector. And that'll be the second element, which is right over here. And we slide this even more by another time step. And we do this so on until we get this final vector over here. And now we have another layer of vectors where time is in this direction and each is represented by eight elements in this direction. We perform another convolution operation, but in this case, we have a window size of five instead of the three that we had in the first layer. And we're going to convolve it with basically five matrices of eight cross three. And so when we do the convolution, you'll get like five, three cross one vectors. You take the sum of them and that's only going to lead to one three cross one vector. And in the similar case, we create, we slide the window, create every single three cross one vector over here. Now at this stage, what we do is we're going to ignore the, the time dimension and basically take the maximum value across the entire time dimension. And we do that three times over here. And once we determine these max values, we can then determine, well, which classification this belongs to, whether we set a B or a D or a G. For a more detailed explanation on time delay neural networks, I've written an accompanying blog post that describes exactly the operation that I just discussed, but it's a lot more written detail with some more mathematics. So if you are curious, I highly suggest you check this out. The link will be in the description below. Now these time delay neural networks are fantastic as they allow for a way for us to process temporal data, something that neural networks weren't able to do in the past. However, at this time, 1989, these neural networks can really only solve very simplistic natural language tasks, such as just like phoneme classification and nothing that's a little more complex. A lot of this is because of less advances in terms of software as well as hardware. But a lot of that did change over the coming decades. For example, on the software front, in 2001, we saw the introduction of this paper called Neural Probabilistic Language Models. Before this, word vectors used to be represented by very sparse matrices that made it very difficult for computers to process. However, with this paper, we would represent individual words with very dense and continuous vectors. So this means that now, like the word like mouse, king and queen would be represented by vectors that are much more tractable. This could be like, let's say 64 dimensions or 128 dimensions, something that can be much more easily processed by a computer. And on top of that, these word vectors, if learned properly, they could encode meaning, which means that words that are similar together would be closer to each other. So in this case, like king and queen could be represented by numbers that are closer to each other than they are to, let's say, mouse, which is very different in meaning. Apart from the software advances, there, were, there was a really instrumental hardware change that did occur that affected how NLP evolved. And this was the introduction of CUDA by NVIDIA in 2007. CUDA acts as an interface between the developer as well as the GPU. And so it allows us to make use of the advantages that GPUs provide, that is parallel computation. And with the rise of neural networks, which were designed to handle and process inputs and data in parallel, this became a huge game changer that actually revolutionized not just natural language processing, but even the deep learning revolution itself. And so with the accompanying software changes, the hardware changes, and also the availability of more and more data, between 2008 and 2011, we saw the renaissance of time delay neural networks once again but this time using much more complicated NLP tasks. Now let's talk a little bit about exactly how these time delay neural networks were used for solving much more complex tasks. So the cool thing about time delay neural networks are that they, unlike traditional neural networks, could process sequential and temporal data. So let's say that we had an input sentence, the cat sat on the mat, 
Now, each of these words, as we mentioned, can be represented by continuous dense vectors. And that here is this LTW1. This is a continuous dense vector representation of, well, the padding. This is the continuous dense representation of the word the. This is the word cat. And this is the word sat on and mat and so on. Now, we can have, aside from just this core vector that represents the meaning of the word, we can encode other certain features of, let's say, of this word. For example, we can encode the part of speech that the word the is, or cat, or sat is, and this could be a feature too. And this could be another like big vector representation. Another feature, like a feature three, could be the stemmed version of each of these words that could also be represented as some vector. And we would then have, let's say, k such features, which we would concatenate. And so we would have like a really tall, long vector, which we would say is of size d, to represent each and every single word here. And note that each of these embeddings and parameters need to be learned, and they will be learned during this training process. And so from this lookup table of values, we perform a convolution operation. Now, the convolution operation will consist of this kernel M1 that we apply, let's say in this case, in three at a time. So we're doing an element-wise for three elements. We are performing an element-wise product followed by a summation. And this is going to essentially just be like three matrices like we talked about before in the original time delay neural network in 1989. And so when we apply the convolution here and sliding window, we will get a new set of vectors. After this convolution operation, we'll ignore the time dimension and then perform a max pooling. That is that for every single one of the dimensions, we will take the highest activation value. And so with the max pooling operation, we are going to end up with a fixed size vector of N1HU. This is really interesting because no matter whatever the sequence length is for the input, how many ever words there are in the sentence, we will always end up with this same fixed length vector. And when you have a fixed length vector, we can now layer on top of it any of the traditional neural network feed forward fully connected layers. And so in order to learn more complex relationships, we can now layer in a linear layer followed by an activation and another linear layer, for example, and with an additional convolution. Now, after this, we could actually, you know, make it go into like a softmax layer to perform, let's say, part of speech recognition, or we can also, you know, tune it to become a language model or any other natural language task. And so the cool things about this time delay neural network approach for now solving more complex natural language tasks is that the ordering of words is considered and parameters can be shared. And this is just the facet or nature of convolution operation where the learned parameters are going to be the, the context window. And that context window is shared parameters that we simply slide across the input. And the sentences can be of varying length. The cons, however, is that it can be a pretty complex operation, especially if you're just trying to understand what the word embeddings or learning the word embeddings are. And also the max pooling may be a very oversimplifying operation, especially since we're only grabbing one activation within a large sequence. But within a large sequence, there could have been multiple activations that would have been very strong. And we might be missing out on some signals there. To deal with this first con of complex nature of learning word embeddings, well, this can kind of be solved with the word to vec architecture, which was later introduced in 2013. I have an entire video on how word to vec and different architectures like it work, but essentially we can learn word embeddings with very simple architectures. And the other con here, which is that max pulling may be an oversimplifying operation, this can be solved with something called dynamic convolution neural networks, which we'll take a look at now. A dynamic convolution neural network is a type of convolution neural network, but its architecture really depends on the length of the input sentence. And so it is dynamic. In this case, let's say that we have an input sentence, the same one called the cat sat on the red mat. And so this is a sentence with seven words. And so we have, let's say that each of these words is represented by like a four dimensional vector. And so we see four dimensions and we have seven words over here. 
Now we can perform a wide convolution. And let's say that we perform a wide convolution with, let's say, a kernel of size three. And so when you perform a wide convolution, like we talked about before, the result is going to be the input length, which is seven, plus the kernel length, which is three, minus one. So it's seven plus three minus one, which is nine, and that's why you'll see like nine elements over here. And we have two of these because let's say that, you know, we apply one type of kernel to extract one set of features of the input, and we can ap apply another kernel or another type of filter in order to extract other kinds of features from this same input. And so this image just shows two kind of kernels, but we can have many. Now from this, we are going to perform a dynamic pulling operation. Before, what we would do is just take the max MUMMA activation across this entire input, regardless of how many elements there are. But with dynamic max pulling, we are going to not only take the top one, but the top K activations. And what K is really is a function of the input sentence length, seven. You can compute it with this formulation over here. If you do all of that math, you will see that it turns out to be five. And so we'll take the five largest activations across the time dimension. And that is how we get the next pooling layer. And then we perform a similar convolution and pooling operation and eventually flatten this in order to get a fully connected layer. And once we have a fully connected layer, we can do any traditional convolution operation on top of it. So a cool thing about this dynamic CNN is that the architecture itself is dynamic and less information is lost if for especially like much longer sentences. However, a con here is just the core essence of the convolution operation where we cannot model long-term dependencies explicitly very well. So for example, when we perform a sliding window convolution, let's say in this case, we have a convolution with window is three. That means that like each of these elements or each of these words will really only interact with the words that are just in its immediate vicinity because it's limited by the kernel width. And because the width is only three, it'll only really look at its neighbors so well. In order to look much further, you would need to increase the kernel size. But the problem with convolution is that if you increase the kernel size, the number of parameters that are required to be learned scales quadratically. And so it's not a super effective way, especially for learning very long-term dependencies as sentences get longer and longer, or when we're processing paragraphs or essays. However, this is kind of solved with more recent technologies on long short-term memory RNNs, as well as transformer neural networks. I've spoken about both of these in their individual videos in great detail, so I do highly recommend you checking those videos out for more information. Essentially, LSTM RNNs have preserved some form of memory. And so for even later input words in a sentence, they still have context of words that mu occurred much more previously. And more recently, we have transformer neural networks, which use the concept of attention to understand dependencies between words, even if those words are much further away. And this attention-based architecture is kind of how a lot of the large language models perform today, including ChatGPT. And so while the convolution operation is useful in natural language processing, there has definitely been some advances where it has taken some sideline more in recent times, at least in NLP. That said, I do feel like understanding the convolution operation and its essence in NLP is super important in order to understand where we are today and how we got to like the large language model world that we are in right now. And with that, thank you all so much for watching. I'm going to link this article that I've written with a lot more details down in the description below. So please do check it out and also do follow me on Medium if you can. And I will be seeing you in another one. Bye-bye.